Well, we're at, we're at Tel Megiddo, and you can see the, the steepness of the hill coming up right behind me. Of course, why would you want a steep hill right in front of your city? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It makes it hard for the enemy. It makes it easy to defend. And the archaeologists dispute exactly how many, how many what we call occupation layers are inside the cell, tell, but we're looking at something like 22, 23. Now, Tel Megiddo has water. It controls a major trade route. And it's, it's, um, there were three things you really wanted to look for. You wanted, when you build a city, a defensible position. You wanted it to be on a trade route so you'd prosper, and you wanted it to have water. And Megiddo has all those, and not only that, but we saw the Carmel Ridge and how it formed a wall from north to south. And Megiddo, just to the south of us, is one of the, one of the two major passes through the Carmel Range, and it's actually the wider of the two. The other major one was at Tanakh, and many times you'll hear them put together in the Bible, Tanakh and Megiddo, because they were the two cities that controlled the two widest passes from the north to the south through the Carmel Range. And so we've got, you know, whoever first settled it really liked it, then the next guys came in and they really liked it. And as Francis said, they didn't have bulldozers to clear away rubble, so you just kind of stomped on it and flattened it out. And then they would build a layer and then it would be, the city would be conquered and the houses knocked over and the mud would just be all stomped down and then the next, uh, the next layer. And so there's something like 22, 23 occupation layers here at Tel Megiddo and we'll be walking up onto the Tel uh, and seeing some of the sites up there. Now, Megiddo is very famous because of the Battle of Armageddon. And so I'd like to take a look in Revelation, the book of Revelation. Um, you will see this place again, probably from the top down. <laughs> but in Revelation, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. I'm gonna be fighting the wind here just a little bit. Um, well, I, let's, go to, let's go to 16, first of all. And in, in Revelation chapter 16, we can start at verse 12. Revelation chapter 16 is closing on the very end of the book of Revelation from a chronological point of view, or at least the tribulation from a chronological point of view. You know that, uh, in fact, isn't there a movie out, something like The Seventh Seal or something like that? Yeah, I'm not very big on those kind of movies. But anyway, the, the, in, as Revelation opens up and the tribulation begins, there are seven seals. Then after the seven seals, there are seven trumpets. Then after the seven trumpets, there are seven thunders. But what the revelation is about the seven thunders, we don't know. The angel said, seal that up, and John didn't write what that was about. Then after the seven thunders, there are seven bowls. And if you look at verse 12 of Revelation 16, it says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Now, as I've said, I have a love-hate relationship with the New International Version of the Bible, and this is one of the things that I love. If you're reading the King James Version, it says vile, like you were in a pharmacy or something. And it, the, the whole point of it being a bowl is why, why are some judgments seal judgments, some judgments trumpet judgments, some judgments thunder judgments, some judgments bowl judgments. The point of a bowl is that you can empty it very quickly like when the high priest would take the blood and dash it on the altar. See, so we're, the bowl judgments come fast and hit hard. And where if you get a vial, it's like glug, 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 and you miss the point of the judgment. The, the NIV here does a good translation of the Greek that it's a bold judgment. It comes quick, it hits hard. So in verse 12 it says, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. That's several hundred miles to the north of us. And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon of course, the dragon we know is Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, and that is the, the, the beast is also who we call the Antichrist, that's the beast, and out of the mouth of the false 
prophet, and he's a man that supports the Antichrist. So the, 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 these demons come out of the mouth of Satan, the false prophet, and the, the Antichrist. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle. And the word battle here in the Greek is not the word for a local war, but the word for an extended campaign. We kind of lose that in the translation of the English, but this is an extended campaign, extensive in, in territory and in, in the, um, the military might that's used. And it's to gather them together, together for this campaign, this extensive battle of the great day of God Almighty. And then verse 15 is kind of in, inserted here. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake, keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully uh, exposed. And again, we're supposed to stay awake and not be lulled to sleep by the adversary so that we don't lose out on what's going on and what we can do. Verse 16, then they gathered the kings together, watch this, in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now the question is, why does the text specifically say here that the kings were gathered at a place in Hebrew is called Armageddon? And the, the answer is because at the time that this was written, at the time the New Testament was written, Armageddon was abandoned, Megiddo. The hill of Megiddo was abandoned. Now let's look at Armageddon a second. The Hebrew is Har, H-A-R, which means hill, and Megiddo. So the Hebrew would read Har, Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo. When you pull that over into Greek, the Greek has no H. So Har becomes what? R. And in Greek, if you end a word in a long O, it's a vowel. We call it an omega vowel. But so in order to make sure that people understood that Megiddo wasn't a vowel, but it was a place, the Greek would add the, the, new, the, um, the N ending. So uh, Har Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo in Greek becomes Armageddon. So when we talk about the final battle being Armageddon, we talk about the final battle being the hill of Megiddo. And it's important that you understand that the, the final battle wasn't just in the hill of Megiddo. But what does it say happened here? Who was here? Kings. The kings. We're, we're sitting on the spot where at the end of the tribulation, when the army of the Antichrist fights us, the army of Christ, as we descend from heaven, the kings, the rulers of the Antichrist's army, will gather here at the hill of Megiddo. Now, how big will the battle itself be? Well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 14. Go back a couple chapters in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14. It says, I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now that's Jesus Christ. One like a son of man, this is Jesus Christ. Another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap is come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And it's interesting that the, it, it's portrayed that way, the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's like evil and good have grown and grown and grown. Remember the parable of the tares? The, the evil and the good grows until finally it's time to reap, time to end things, time to take in a harvest. And he, so he says, use your sickle. Verse 16, so he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them 
into the great wine press of God's wrath. Do you see that wine press? The, the battle that we call the Battle of Armageddon through Scripture is called the wine press of God's wrath. And if you read about the wine press of God's wrath, like in the Old Testament, then you're reading about the Battle of Armageddon. And he says, he threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath, verse 20. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Anybody have a text note on how far the blood's going to flow? About 180 miles. About 180 miles. Now that's one of the reasons we know that, that it isn't just a, a local campaign. The armies of the adversary are huge. They're millions and millions that come to fight us as we descend from the heavenlies. And there will be blood flowing for over 180 miles, sometimes as deep as a horse's bridle. You ever stood next to a horse? You know, you're wading shoulder deep through blood for some of that 180 miles. That's how many people are gonna be killed. That's also why the, the Battle of Armageddon is called the Great Feast. And let's go to Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation 19, verse 11, it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Who do you think that would be? Jesus Christ. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And it's, that's an interesting scripture that when you know somebody's name, you have some authority over them. Like somebody could, it, Genevieve teases me because if you're going to catch my attention, there I've just never really answered to John. I've always answered to Shane Height. So Genevieve teases me. She says, "Just say Shane Height," and he gets it. <laughs> but when, but when you say somebody's name, they they're what? And so the Bible is saying nobody has any authority over Jesus Christ. He's going to have a specific name that only he will know. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Verse 14, the armies, plural. There will be angels, there will be us, Christians. We will have been raptured up to heaven. We will come down from heaven with Christ. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the what? wine press he treads the wine press of the fury of the wrath of god almighty on his robe and on his thigh in the aramaic which i think is right reads banner it's not that he has his name on his thigh but on his on his robe and on his banner that he's carrying he has this name written king of kings and lord of lords and i saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair come gather for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with them the false prophet who performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who'd received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them, the Antichrist and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them, the rest of the Antichrist's army, were killed with a sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Let's go to Isaiah 63. So you can imagine all over Israel is going to be just huge, huge heaps of dead bodies. In Isaiah chapter 63, we have a slightly different picture of the aftermath of, of Armageddon. And again, this is, is one of the one of the things that 
Knowing a little bit of the Hebrew is, is very important. Verse 63, chapter 63, rather, verse 1. Who is this coming from Edom? Well, Edom is south of Israel, but it's also the word Edom means red. Now, if blood's flowing for 180 miles, there's a lot of red on the landscape. Who's this coming from Edom, from red, from Basra? Basra in the Hebrew is, is the grape treading, when they tread the grapes. Who's this coming from red, from the grape treading, with his garments stained crimson? Because you don't kill a whole bunch of people without getting blood on you. Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of strength, greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why are your garments red like those of one treading the wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone. From the nations, no one was with me because the people on earth didn't stand with Jesus Christ. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath and their blood splattered my garments. So Isaiah chapter 63, again, portraying the, the, the battle of Armageddon and you can read on. Let's go to Ezekiel 37. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 37. And Ezekiel chapter 30, I say uh, 37, wait a minute, that's not what I want. I want uh, 38, 30, yep, 39 is what I want. Um, in chapter 39, we have more on the battle of Armageddon. And Son of Man prophesy. Son of Man here is Ezekiel, God speaking to Ezekiel, and he says, Son of Man, prophesy against Gog and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I'm against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and drag you along. I will bring you from the far north and send you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and your troops and all the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. You will fall in the open field, for I have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will send for fire on Magog and those who live in safety in the coastlands, and they will know that I am the Lord. I will make known my holy name among the people Israel. I will no longer let my holy name be profaned, and the nations will know that I, the Lord, am the Holy One in Israel. It is coming. It will surely take place, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is the day I have spoken of. Now, after the Battle of Armageddon, remember the blood flowed for how far? How many, how many millions of people do you think died in that war? After the birds and the beasts of the field eat them, what's the landscape going to look like? Yeah, it's going to be covered in bones and weapons. Verse 9, then those who live in the towns of Israel will go out and use the weapons for fuel and burn them up, the small and large shields, the bows and arrows, the war clubs and spears. For seven years, they will use them for fuel. That's how many weapons they'll be. For seven years, they'll use them for fuel. They will not need to gather wood from the fields or cut it from the forest because they will use the weapons for fuel. And they will plunder those who plundered them and loot those who looted them, declares the Sovereign Lord. On that day, I will give Gog a burial place in Israel in the valley of those who travel east toward the sea. It will block the way of travelers because Gog and all his hordes will be buried there. So it will be called the Valley of Ham and Gog. Now look at verse 12. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the lands. This is after the Battle of Armageddon and in the start of the Millennial Kingdom. For seven months, we're burying people. All the people of the land will bury them and the day I am glorified will be a memorable day for them, declares the Sovereign Lord. Now verse 14. Remember that a human bone made you unclean. So it says men will be regularly employed to cleanse the land. In the millennial kingdom, everybody will have work to do. Everybody will have different jobs. Now guess what determines what job you get? What? Yeah, the, the role we play in this life. 
our faithfulness to God, our dedication from our heart. What we do now determines the position we will be in in the future. The disciples were very concerned about this. They kept coming to Christ and said, who's greatest in the kingdom? Who's greatest in the kingdom? And Christ would say, well, if, uh, if you make yourself like a little child, then you're in a position to be the greatest. If you're meek, if you're humble, Verse 14, men will be regularly employed to cleanse the land. Some will go throughout the land, and in addition to them, others will bury those that remain on the ground. At the end of seven months, they will begin their search. As they go through the land and one of them sees a human bone, he will set a marker beside it until the grave diggers have buried it in the valley of Hamangog. Also, the town Hamona will be there, and so they will cleanse the land. Well, I'm, I'm working hard to not be a bone cleanser, you know? I mean, if, if, if our faithfulness now determines what we do, I want to make sure we're faithful now.